Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we're going to be have a special show for women and how we embrace our feminine power, our feminine energy, and own that. And so we're going to be talking to Lynn Roberts, who's the author of this award-winning book, Shape Shifting into Higher Consciousness. And we're going to be getting a sneak preview of her upcoming book, that she co-authored with Sandra Ingerman called Speaking with Nature, Awakening to the Deep Wisdom of the Earth. So welcome, Lynn. Thank you, CJ. It's great to be here. Great to see you. Yeah, again, we were, yeah. Uh, we were doing a show earlier. Um, um, at, this is a pre-record. And uh, gosh, I have to say, this is a beautiful, beautifully written book. Uh, yeah, beautiful. And it's so different. It's so different than this book. Yeah, you've got it upside down. <laughs> yeah, it's so different than this book. Did you feel when you were writing it that it, it did it come from a different place when you were writing it? Yeah, it did. You know, it, I was living in the Ho Rainforest uh, at the uh, edge of the wilderness on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. And so I had a complete immersion with nature mm. as we were writing it. So as a result, I feel like a lot of it was... Um, you know the voice of the voices of nature came through me, and it yeah. was just very powerful, beautiful experience. Yeah, and you can feel that coming through, through the book. It feels um, there are a couple of books that strike that right pose of you. I really felt like I was with you walking through the Ho rainforest and kind of picking up, you know, a banana slug or hearing from an owl and all the wonderful creatures and stories that you have. I could really feel like I was sitting on your side and, and kind of having you be kind of a person guiding me through a tour. So it was really beautifully written. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about um, about feminine powers because there's it, that's a theme that runs throughout. And I would never have thought a banana slug was, <laughs> could be something that lear- helped me learn about my sexuality, but okay, it's in there. <laughs> So tell me a little bit about what you wanted to express to women about their power and how you found it expressed in nature. Well, first of all, you know, nature, I really feel is an alchemical mirror. She really mirrors um, our inner essence and also is a guide and teacher for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the book isn't just for women. It's really about the feminine aspects of all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, within men, there are feminine aspects that need to come out and within women also. And, you know, when we look around culturally, we've really evolved in ways that devalue a lot of what people might call the feminine aspects of being. So for nature, being in nature, it's all right out there, you know, And, and with banana slug, what banana slug modeled and I didn't know, you know, Sandra and I each, she lives in a very different locale in um, New Mexico in the high desert and mountains. Mm-hmm. And I was in the Ho Rainforest, you know, very lush. Um, yeah, completely opposite on the spectrum. Yeah, yeah it was amazing. So, um, and we didn't project onto, you know, these nature beings we wrote about. We really opened ourselves to experience them and to see what teachings would come through. And banana slug, of course, is a very sensitive creature, you know, it doesn't have a shell. And and so it really, for me, mirrored vulnerability, mm-hmm. which is something that's very devalued in our culture, you know, mm-hmm. just being vulnerable and authentic in that vulnerability. And also a lot of people don't like banana slugs for various reasons, mm-hmm. uh, one of which because they eat gardens and the other um, is uh, they find them repulsive physically. You know, and I I just really felt that we have such a narrow range of what beauty is in our culture. Mm -hmm. That this is what, you know, what do we communicate to our young women, to our children, and to ourselves about what's beautiful and what's not, you know, and really, um, so I find nature really allows us a much wider range of Mm -hmm. beauty. Mm -hmm. And maturity really values maturity because everything in the rainforest grows out of depth. And it grows out of, you know, these beautiful, magnificent old trees that die and they're lying on the ground. And then they become nursery trees for new saplings to come out of. So, you know, uh, the sense of, um, you know, being old and aging, you know, we all love ancient trees. What about ancient, beautiful women? What about ancient, beautiful men? You know, 
And nature is such an incredible teacher. You know, my husband and I were walking around Green Lake, which is our little bit of nature here in Seattle. And uh, we were walking along and we were taken back by this tree. And this tree had all these like beautiful sinewy lines, not only in the branches, but then, um, you know, the, the bark had this beautiful kind of curved texture and it had this green, you know, bright green moss and the sun was just hitting it perfectly. And I said, you know, this... <laughs> I said, this this tree really reminds me of Lynn because when, when I was reading the book, it has this sense of like a sensual meandering around. It's not this. And, and what was so fascinating during that walk is that tree was right next to a tree that was all lines, like everything with these straight lines. And it's just so interesting because, you know, the masculine world is all about these straight lines, you know, getting from A to B. And, and as a woman i've been kind of forced into you know kind of fitting into that a to b mentality but i think left to my own dev devices i would be more sinewy and windy you know and it's it's unfortunate because um i think we've lost part of that as women i mean what do you feel well i think you know bringing those aspects that fluidity that sense of um meandering you know, into our lives is very, very important for all of us now. And that we're all faced with choices every day, every moment. We're faced with choices. Do I just really kind of squeeze myself into that box and that linear uh, mode, or do I breathe? And do I, you know, you can't breathe I know. at the same time. Yeah. Or do I breathe and really, really reclaim my life force and my deep creativity and find a way, you know, even in modern, you know, I choose to live differently. I, you know, we each need to really explore that deeply within ourselves. What, what are we doing here? And we're so supported spiritually in many other ways to make new choices. And we have to work with that. I find I have to constantly, um, you know, do a mind entrainment. And I have less bombardment of media and, you know, other things in my life than other people do, especially those who live in urban areas. And it's, I find a real responsibility to recondition myself mm -hmm. and not to buy into the cultural values because they're not working. They're hurting everybody, you know. Yeah. And um, it's very interesting how we approach nature because we are used to dominating nature and we are used to seeing nature only as a resource. And, you know, we fit ourselves into that same category. We're not good enough unless we can do this or unless we can provide that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all mirroring all the time. Right. And so we, you know, when we're in nature, oftentimes people have an agenda. I want to do a hike or I want to right. do a walk or I want to have my chit-chat conversation with yeah. my friend. You know, and um, when you're out walking in the park next time, you can just open that up, make it wide open, be a child, you know, if we can remember when we were children and, yeah. and we just had an aimless quality that was so rich and full and so full of imagination and deep creativity and deep sense of connection. We really need to reclaim that, Absolutely. you know, to be able to um, dream in a new way and uh, create new possibilities around us. And we can't do that unless we open up this space. Mm -hmm. And when you go into a forest, forests are all about diversity. Mm -hmm. you know, there are some straight lines and then there's everything all over. Yeah. And, you know, we like nice, neat little piles. Well, a forest is a mess. I mean, yeah. It's really chaotic right. and fluid and death and birth and life. And it's all mixed up together, you know, mm -hmm. and... When we cut down forests and people on the East Coast think, well, what's the big deal about all those forests being cut in the Northwest because they're replanting the trees? Right. Well, we're not replanting a forest, and you can't. It takes a thousand years you know, to replant mm -hmm. old-growth forests. But the forest in the way that you describe, which is life and death and yes. non-linear rows. That's what a forest is. It's not yeah. a monoculture that's yeah. Close together where animals can't even move through. Yeah. That's not a healthy forest, you know, and that's not a healthy human population either. As we know, diversity is all about life, you know. Yeah, that's a beautiful illustration of, and I didn't even know that. I'm from the Northwest, and I and I, it's like I just don't understand the whole clear cutting. I mean, not that I like I love cutting trees down, but until reading that passage where you said, yeah, they plant the trees in these linear planes so that. It doesn't allow nature to really come in and do its thing. So it's not a it's not a 
replacement and that I also didn't know is they buzz down the trees after they get to a certain size. I mean, it's never a replacement for the natural ecosystem, which yeah. I totally didn't get. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you for educating a fellow Northwesterner who probably should know better. Um, I want to go back to um, going back to um, something that you said earlier about how the forest has, li- you know, it has life growing out of death. And, ha- and you asked a really poignant question, which is, do we look at the, you know, we can look at a beautiful old tree and see the majesty and beauty in those trees. Now you take a, you can't take an old woman nowadays and no one, you know, we're all, I'm guilty of this at least. I'm all trying to like, I want to be back when, I don't think I can be 20, but you know, 40, like I'm trying to get back to some earlier time. And I thought, well, what is forcing me to want to do that? I mean, I, it's, it's a combination of the culture in which we, we care, we, we love new beauty and growth, but we don't so much like, you know, wrinkles and sagging and, uh, and, and, decay right i'm decaying i mean i I literally am decaying my life energy is you know was at a peak and it's now on the downside for better or worse i mean that's part of nature so how does one what could nature tell us about going through those phases and and being okay with it all well i think you know what you expressed about seeing the beauty in these aging trees is is a good practice for us because again the more we appreciate that beauty in in what is decaying around us and dying and seeing how the death is uh, offering to life i mean there's a woman at uh, the university of uh, british columbia susan simons i believe who uh, through her research, we understand now that these ancient, what she calls mother trees, they're huge and beautiful, and uh, they're really responsible for the life of quite large regions. And she said before they die, what they do is they download. They just empty out a bunch of nutrients into these saplings. Wow. Offering. Talk about beautiful. You know, we've, yes. we've got to, again, culturally shift our mindsets and make sure we really communicate this to children about what beauty really is and open our hearts to appreciate that and in ourselves too. And I know I'm 58, you know, and, and it's, it is a journey, you know, as we get older, to, you know, 60s, two, two years away for me. And uh, so I've gone through a process also of what is beauty for me and what is, you know, is it about how I look or is it about my spirit? And do I have to, you know, lose my energy or um, are there other ways also? You know, for instance, in indigenous cultures, uh, um, often the age of 52 is seen as, you know, the wisdom age where you really become an adult finally. Yes. It's a great thing. And also that, you know, we're not, you know, we're not creating children anymore, but our life force is so strong. And, and oftentimes this is when in Eastern traditions, you know, they talk about the Kundalini raising from the base of the spine and, and a hot flashes, power surges mm. this is to serve you as a woman for the rest of your life. And we can re-energize in a very different way. You know, I do a lot of practices to to do that for myself. And there are times when I feel like, God, I have energy like I did when I was a teenager. You know, ah, so, so we also can kind of start to shape shift and and shift our views that you know that we've implanted in terms of what happens when you reach 50, 60, 70. I'm actually, my daughter was helping me because I said I want to do research on athletes in their 90s. Yeah. And she blew me away because she provided all these internet sources of yeah. people in their 70s, 80s, 90s who hadn't done, you know, extensive physical uh, programs before and just totally changed their bodies, their lives, yeah. their energies. And, and it's like, you know, we can't limit ourselves. And mm. um, so it's a good time to really shift a lot of these paradigms on their head mm. and, and reclaim our beauty uh, in authenticity and in our deep connection, you know, with ourselves and with the world around us. And and those are more whole values. Those are more, more sustainable values in terms of creating a culture and communities that really uh, understand the, the beauty of life, you mm-hmm. know. <laughs> you know, what really struck me about what you just said is I'm, I'm combining several different things that you just said because... And, and relating it to an experience that I had recently where I started, I've just started getting hot flashes. I'm 52. 
And so I started getting hot flashes and I had a real, I'm like, this is hot flash. This is a hot flash. I wasn't sure if it was or not. Like maybe I have a fever. I'm like, no, this is a hot flash. Mm. And um, the next day I found myself really, really feeling sad. And I said, I'm not sure. I've, I've like over that course of that week, I found myself getting progressively sadder. And I tuned into it and I was like, what's this all about? And I realized that what it was for me was the sense of, wait a second, you know, as a woman, as I understand myself as a woman, part of it is actually being able to bear children. Now, I'm not going to be able to bear children. So what does it mean I am? If I'm not this person who can create life, then what am I? And what was beautiful about what you said about that tree is it actually provides the nutrients for the saplings to grow from. And I was thinking, and I kind of had come to the same conclusion where when we hit our 50s and 52, I'm hitting that number exactly right now, which I love the fact that you just said that. When we hit 52, we're we kind of move from like, we're no longer girls, we're women. We are like old wise women. And instead of like an old wizened woman, it's like, I'm an old wise woman. I have like a role and a responsibility now that I think is different than when I was in my forties and wiping snot and cleaning diapers. You know, it's a, it's a different kind of thing. What, what happened? Cause I know you've said you're now 50, Eight? Yeah. What happened when you hit that 52 period when you kind of or reach that point where, well, one, I love how you reframed hot flashes as an energy surge. I love that. But what, tell me a little bit about that transition for you. Well, you know, I, I've had a pretty archetypal life. So I actually almost died when I turned 52. Oh, my goodness. And, um, so I had a major, major life review at that point, and it was, you know, during the time that my children were leaving home, and um, so I, um, you know, it's, uh, we can have major life reviews for many different reasons, almost dying really causes yeah. that wow. strongly, but um, I had to really shift my sense of what... Um, creating meant because I was used to being a caretaker and I love doing that. I'm very nurturing, you know, yeah. and, and, um, you know, and it's always harder to nurture ourselves. So that was one shift I had to go through is, is how do I bring more of that energy to me, you know, and my children, it's not healthy for them for me to keep infusing them so much anyway, you know, right. yeah. to release them and let them grow. Yeah. And also understanding, again, it's these power surges, energy surges in us that, what is that about? That's, you know, we could look at it and hot flash or, you know, whatever purely physiological explanation, or we could look at it, experience it in our bodies as energy mm. and life force. And it's a powerful thing to do that, you know, to feel that fire engine red come up. And yeah. You know, you know? I know. Whoa, Interesting. That's powerful, you know? Yeah. That's yeah. And it's a shift of consciousness and understanding also that um, that uh, we are deeply creative beings, and this time in our lives is about creating more than ever. It's yeah. not about physiologically, you know, popping out babies anymore, but it's about really bringing our deep soul creation into the world to offer to maybe a very large realm, yeah. you know, if not to our, you know, those around us, it could be our deep creativity, I do writing, you know, and, and you're doing your programs here, and however we find that expression, some of us do it very quietly, and maybe very few people will ever know about it, but that's right. our unique creative expression, and other people, you know, are more visible in what that means, but it's a way of offering beauty back to the world. Mm. You know, human beings are innately creative. We came here to create and to be in harmony with nature and to, you know, offer out. We're really a self-absorbed culture where we're typically mostly thinking about what can I get, what do I need, what do I want, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and what you see in nature is an incredible offering out. When I lived in the Ho Valley, um, Ho Rainforest and River Valley, I just became so aware of constantly how nature was offering out for new life all the time mm -hmm. and how beautiful that is. And when you offer out, so much is infused with life and that life radiates back to you. Mm. So it's a constant giving and receiving. Uh, they're inseparable. And um, 
So, you know, the, this life phase is very, very powerful for me. And, it, you know, we take little steps through it and we feel our feelings too. Some things we mourn, we need to feel our grief about, you know. And it took me a while to, and I still feel it now. It's like I loved my toddlers at home. I know. Just that, you know. Yeah. On the other hand, I have so much more room and freedom um, to be able to create in ways I never have before. I could live in the rainforest for almost two years, you know, yeah. and that amazing experience and that we don't have to box ourselves in as we, we may have when we were in demand and we had responsibilities, you know, in those ways. There's a lot more freedom and spaciousness and possibility yeah. and that we have a whole new life chapter to open to. And traditionally in indigenous cultures, elders are honored. You know, and the grandchildren are sitting at their feet and at their knees and listening to the stories. It's about storytelling and it's about all that wealth of experience. You know, old trees, ancient trees, they're like wisdom carriers, you know, and so are we as we age. We have so much that we can offer uh, that really feeds, um, you know, the younger people in our generation and also us. As yeah, well. I love the idea of... It's interesting because the thing that you just described, if, if I think of retirement as my time to give, you know, it's like I have this wealth of wisdom and resources and energy and creative energy, and it's all about like giving it to others. You know, that's a, it's, it's so different than what most people think about retirement, right? Which is, I'm going to like, this is my time for me. <laughs> it's like my time for me. I'm going to golf. I'm going to get massages. I'm going to hang out with the girls. And I actually think there's nothing wrong with that because you need to have space after taking all that time of just being so productive all the time. But it's so different. And I do think that there are, and to be fair, there are a lot of people who are about giving as well. But I, but I think it's more about this is my time to like, you know, go for it versus this is my time to give. I don't know. What do you feel? I don't know when you talk to your friends. Yeah, but... uh, you know, I feel that, you know, people ask me about retirement. It's like, that's not a concept for me, you know, yeah. I have to design my life differently. And I can't imagine not creating, I mean, my whole life. Yeah. But um, I think what happens in our culture in particular, that people have to work very hard you know, and and um, just to maintain sometimes their family structures and right. what they have to support to have children themselves. And it can, that's a long, hard journey. Yeah. And we also have created a work structure. You know, in other cultures, I lived even in India when I was 24 for a year. And I loved how, you know, they would work in the morning for four hours and they'd take three or four hours off in the midday and have a huge meal with their family, the whole family together. Oh, that's luscious. And then yeah. nap. And then open the shops again at four or five or six or seven, yeah. you know, for the evening. And what we've done here is we've created a work environment where people are forced to be in, oftentimes in cubicles for eight to ten hours a day, mm -hmm. you know, and then they have their prescribed time at home and, and they can barely catch up. So, of course, people <laughs> re look to retirement yeah. and hope that they don't get a life-threatening illness before yeah. it arrives. So I totally, totally understand that and I also see that oftentimes, uh, you know, that that kind of idea that this will be my time and it'll be wonderful. Oftentimes, it doesn't seem to work for people. They find there's an emptiness there, and part of it is because I think it is a natural life phase mm -hmm. to move into a deep creativity as we age, and also not necessarily to separate ourselves out in, you know, communities sixty and over and without you know, a diversity of ages around us, that can be very lonely, you know? Oh, yes. I'm just kind of imagining, like, you know, you're describing these ancient forests. It's a mix of all these different things. You don't see just gigantic ancient trees, you know, right next to each other. You no, know, they'd die if they didn't, you know, I mean, things, um, I think it's in Germany, they were cleaning up the forest and, you know, scavenging everything on the forest floor, and then the forest starts dying. I mean, it needs that diversity, and we're the same. We are nature. You know, we can't ignore those um, teachings that nature is offering to us, you know, because we are nature too. And oftentimes it just takes some reflection, or what do we do when we're waking up in the middle of the night and something, what is it that woke us up and disturbs us on our heart? You know, those are things to really pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we just ignore those little 
tuggings, you know, mm -hmm. and kind of jump into the next thing or I'll, oh, I'll go shopping and right. you know, kind of distract myself. But this is a time when it's very important to create a more soulful way of living. And, you know, it, it so enriches us personally. We're not going to, when we give in those ways and we tap our deep creativity and let it flow through us, that is life feeding us. Yeah. It's not depleting us at all. It's a yeah. beautiful thing. It's interesting because I think that um, I'm imagining um, someone will sing to this and going, yeah, but how? how? How do I do that? How do I start to do that? And I think it's a lot of the things that you actually talk about in this book. You know, it's it's taking a walk. I love how, like you were saying, that you, instead of just like, I'm going to go from here to here, and, and I have to have these many steps and these many minutes because I have to go to the next thing. It's, you know, taking time to meander around through, throughout your whole day. And, and it's in those gaps that I think you find your creativity. It sounds... It, do, it sounds like a leap of faith, but that's at least what I found. How about you? How did you find your creativity and your sense of what you wanted to do next to write a book? How did you find that? Well, my life kind of shows me what's next, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I, I work very strongly with, you know, I have to meet my own deadlines and I have to be on computer. I have to do those things, you know, to to um, uh, get my work out there, and uh, but I really have to balance it with that open, spacious time. And for me, I'm a very sensitive person, and um, I'm very uh, neurologically sensitive, so I get overstimulated easily, and last month I had all kinds of deadlines, and my eyes just got really screwed up, and, and my sorry. Brain, I just had to take time out. And, um, and I try to integrate that into my daily life mm. because uh, really, you're right, I, and I talk about this in Shape Shifting into Higher Consciousness and the new book, Speaking with Nature, that Sandra and I wrote, it's all through it about how you can create space, uh, even if you live in a busy city, you can yeah. do it there. Um, even if you can't go outside of your apartment that's on the 20th floor, you can right. still connect with nature there. But it's very important that we start to uh, examine our lives. You know, I, I have to do that, and on a daily basis, because it's very easy for it to seep in where everything else presses in and it seems more important. Mm -hmm. But really, i found that, you know, I do a lot of practices, and that opens up this space for me. And I do a lot of breathing and movement practices from mm -hmm. the Tibetan tradition, and I, I do um, stone lifting to strengthen my body and also mm -hmm. to um, connect me with the earth. Oh, I love that. I go outside as much as possible and connect with, I have a particular tree I spend time with. I try to spend two hours uh, when I go out there, and I can't go every day, but when I can, and... Um, but really understanding and, and habitually saying that these are primary. Um, how I really inhabit my body and my relationship to my environment and my work and um, my larger environment of the earth and community is more important than anything. Mm. Because if I'm not aligned in those ways, then what I am putting out there and what I'm engaging and what I, whatever I'm doing just is kind of disembodied, you know, and we yeah. walk around that way every day. Like, I know, you know, I know. Fragmented, disembodied, stressed, you know, it's like, really, what's the point of life if we're doing Yeah, that? yeah, you know, I actually have um, two urban versions of the thing that you mentioned, and um, I talked to a girlfriend, and she said, you know, I, I'm rushing around, I'm going to carpool, and then I'm going to this board meeting, and I'm doing this other thing, and I've just had these days layered and layered, and then I, I have, I, I have like a little 30-minute gap in between you know, when I finish my meeting and I'm going to go pick up the kids. And she said, I, she used to learn, work on, she used to live on a farm and she really missed that kind of meandering around nature. So yeah. in that 30 minute gap that she has, she just gets out of her car. She has no idea where she's going, but she figures she's going to explore a neighborhood in Seattle that she's never been to. And she's going to go into stores that she's never been to. And she's going to, you know, and she has no path. She just knows she has 30 minutes and she just kind of meanders around. And I thought, what a wonderful experience because then you're not walking through life. You're walking with life. Do you know what I mean? Where it's sometimes I, I, at that same time when she was talking about that, I thought, you know what? I walk through life. I go from my desk to the bathroom and it's like, boom, you know, I'm not, I'm not 
checking out the flowers on the side or, you know, I'm just, <clears throat> you know, I don't think <laughs> at all. And that idea of like walking with life and interacting with life versus kind of just going from point A to B, it's kind of the equivalent of taking a hike and going from the beginning to the end of the hike so that you can get to the destination and missing all the little, you know, side attractions on the side. Um, but those are kind of the urban, <laughs> urban examples of the same thing. Um, I wanted to go back to something that you said that I think is really powerfully expressed in your book, um, Speaking with Nature, and, and you talk about almost every single meditation starts with dropping into your heart and dropping into your body, and you just mentioned that before. What does that mean, and, and why is it important? Well, because that's who we are, right? We're, we're fully, uh, we're in bodies, yeah. <laughs> first of all. And uh, oftentimes we may forget we're in a body even, and we have a, a whole sensual experience. We smell, we touch, we see, we hear, you know, um, we taste. And uh, we're also full of feelings. I mean, that's what humanness is about. We're full of, you know, we have experiential feelings and for each other, and we're impacted by things around us. And what we do to survive these busy lives that you just described is most of the time we cut all of that off. So mm -hmm. we become kind of disembodied or we're operating from here up, mm -hmm. forgetting that we have a whole body and right. that body at our feet is connected deep into the earth. And we can't possibly fulfill ourselves. Um, you know, humanity really can't evolve in that place because we have to, first of all, breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're when you're breathing only in your chest, that's fight or flight. That's that's no way to get through life. But that's the way most of us are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, this is what we're teaching through our embodiment to our children, to our new generations. You know, and we're teaching uh, our children that being overcommitted is the way to go. You know, right. so you, those are the things, and they're hard things to look at because it requires. You know, oftentimes those things don't change until people do have a life-threatening illness or something interrupts it, and then they wake up, you know. Uh, but uh, these, are, these are important things to look at and to open up the space. But we can't possibly very genuinely relate to another person or a project we're doing or really bring good energy into the world without, first of all, being present ourselves, you know, and really feeling what we're feeling opening our heart, slowing down, being in our body, having our physical sensations, which also opens us to our intuitive, you know, uh, perceptions. And you see that in nature because nature doesn't do that. Nature doesn't, you don't grow something by boom, you know, that's it. It's <laughs> everything spirals, everything yeah. spirals and moves and, and takes twists and turns and mm. And it's so restorative, you know, they've done, um, there's so much scientific evidence out now too, and I mentioned before about the uh, trees emit airborne substances that have a healing impact on us and lower our stress hormones. And, um, you know, just listening to nature for a couple of hours can totally shift your physiology or even less time. Walking barefoot, we have thousands of nerve receptors in our, the bottoms of our feet. Yes. And we really uh, absorb healing forces from the earth. And we also, uh, we can um, release some of that, uh, you know, from being on computers and all these electronics. We build a charge, an electrical mm -hmm. charge. We really need to release that, and, and the earth can take it to balance us. So um, these are, you know, opening up the space is so important, and you're right, the book is all about that, and how do we inhabit our own bodies. Right. You know, we're not going to start saving our trees unless we, first of all, can really be in our own bodies and, and look at a tree and feel something, you know? Right, it's, yeah. It's a relationship, yeah. and yeah. Yeah, I think that you're right, and it's, it's almost reflective the question that I asked like why would you want to do that I mean <laughs> because uh, you know I'm 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 operating I'm like a floating head the vast majority of days except for the couple times that I take a walk I force myself to go and I we have a back alley that's kind of like a I view it as my nature hike and then we have all these beautiful trees as I walk over and I get lunch and I just force myself all the time to just take breaks even when I don't so I, I and I guess I didn't know why I was, I just knew that I had to do that, but it does get you back into your body and noticing things aside from yourself. I, I um, interviewed um, Sylvia Borstein, who from, um, she's a Buddhist slash 
Jewish slash teacher. <laughs> and uh, she was saying, we were talking about electronics, and she was saying she has, you know, a mala kind of thing. She has a big, you know, I, I don't have one, but she has a big long one, you know, those Buddhist ones that have 180, 108 ohm kind of beads. And she just counts those beads, and she said that she sends love to everyone. So she's like, I send love to my father, I send love to my mom, I send love to CJ, I send love to friends. And she just sits there and counts her beads. And it's, it's the most quiet meditation, and you can do it when you're sitting and waiting for groceries. I mean, you can do it at any point in time, but it just gets her connecting to other people. You know, it doesn't have to be trees necessarily, right? I mean, it's probably nice to connect to trees, but that's how she does it. She just kind of sits there and, and counts her beads. Or she says that um, in Buddhist, I have a meta meditation. So she's like, I send you love. I send you happiness. I send you peace. And she just sits there in line when she's in the grocery store. I hope to be in the grocery store next to her all the time. Because <laughs> she's just like, I send that person love. May they have peace. May they have joy. May they have happiness. I, I thought that was a lovely one, too, to kind of just connect. In a really kind of urban setting, you know, it's not, you don't have to, I mean, because some people don't have beautiful urban settings, I mean, beautiful rustic settings like you do. And that's, you know, that's an important point, because even if a lot of people are in cubicles all day, and yeah. if you can bring a plant in, if you can remember to stretch, you know, and be able to breathe, notice if you're kind of like this. And yeah, this, you know? yeah. And, uh, if you have an opportunity to get up and go look out a window, um, you know, there are some small things that you can do that make all the difference to open up that space. Even when you're crunched in linear time, just a few breaths and you can open up into um, a more spacious place. Yes. You know? um, and when you get home from work, if you don't just kind of jump into the next thing, you know, if you actually um, change your clothes, jump in the shower and just feel the water and feel it washing, every, mm -hmm. any stress you picked up, just let it go down the drain, mm -hmm. and change your clothes, put on fresh clothes, because your clothes will associate work with right. you, and you'll bring whatever tension you may have accumulated, you know, you're going to carry yeah. it with you, why do that in the evening? Yeah. So there are very small ways, and you know, also when you're walking uh, in the city, there are flower boxes, flowers to look at, and there are birds, and there's a lot of traffic, but you might hear birds through the traffic. You know, there's um, a lot of very simple practices yeah. where you can kind of listen through the urban noises to hear birds and to notice if you see little squirrels running up in trees or looking into people's eyes. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, ways that we can cut through that habitual um, separation that yeah. we with. And, and everything in the city is made of nature too even if we're on the 20th floor yes. through those many floors and into the earth and you know we're connected still and everything that building is made of comes from the earth yeah. as well even the noises i think too because yeah. i remember i'm um, being in new york i had lived in new york city because i had a, a boyfriend who was there and i just remember the like the loud city ee, 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 woo! you know all those noises and they and they can just jar your system but if you imagine them like different versions of birds they you know what i mean it's it's all just a shift in perspective because this is this is nature too it may be a different kind of version of nature but these these entities these sounds that are emanating around you they're part of nature too so if you can just relax into them like you hear them and you think of them as birds and you just relax into them it helps. It helps. All right. So I wanted to talk to you. Um, uh, oh, we, I want to have time to do a meditation. So um, could you walk us through an experience that um, would maybe help us drop, you know, if, if we were in a busy day or, or any kind of experience for us to uh, get a sense of what you're talking about? Because you have so many beautiful meditations in your book. Well, um, I'd like to... Uh probably share about blackberry because blackberry plant uh, I feel really teaches us about uh, the rhythms you know uh, in life and that you know talks to us about slowing down when we're rushing through so um, do a little uh, meditation with that uh, and remember that blackberry you know again you can't rush how things are growing and a blackberry goes through different stages of color and growth and you just can't rush it and you can't rush it when a berry is ready to be taken off the vine, is ready, you know. You right. can't do it before. It's hard to tug and it doesn't yeah. taste good, you yeah. know. 
and if you wait too long, and then it's it's kind of pulpy. Yeah. So um, the rhythm, those rhythms of life are very important. So why don't we just close our eyes for a moment, and we'll start by taking a few nice deep breaths. One nice deep breath. Um. And another deep cleansing breath. And one more nice refreshing breath. And take a few moments just to allow that movement of breath through your body, just to feel that rhythm of breathing. And notice if your breath is a little shallow, then maybe it's a little too focused in the chest and If that's the case, just really soften those belly muscles and that lower back. And remember that our lungs extend deep, um, you know, almost to our belly, actually. If you feel your ribs, they go down to your waist, and your lungs go down as far as that. So your, your body really wants to breathe fully and deeply. So let those belly muscles relax, the opposite of what we're conditioned to do in this culture. And if your belt's too tight, you loosen it, you pop those buttons, just let yourself really breathe. And remember that no matter what is happening around you, the breath is always something you can come back to. You can take a nice deep breath and feel your center again. And there may be a gentle movement in your body with the breath. And when babies are born, healthy births, uh, you can actually see the movement of breath in their body. It's like this wave from the top of their head to the tips of their toes. Kind of a little snake-like wave through the body with the breath, and this is very natural. So let your body just have a little bit of movement. Just reclaim that. And again, that's some of the fluidity, just bringing it back in. And you know, when we work with our body this way, it totally impacts our consciousness. Everything about what we're experiencing, how we're experiencing it, how we see things, how we solve problems. It just opens up the space so we feel more possibility. We don't feel so claustrophobic and hemmed in. So feel that gentle movement of your body with the breath. Just breathing and being. There's nothing you have to do in these moments. And as you're breathing and being, allow yourself just to have a little peek, kind of maybe review even today or a typical day in your life. And just take a few moments to look at, you know, how you eat, how you prepare your food or buy your food, where you eat and how you move through the process of eating your food or whatever it is, um, how you do your job or your craft, how you're relating with your children, how you are in meetings, in your leisure time. And notice if you have a sense that you are rushing from one thing to the next, or you're rushing through whatever you're doing, if you're feeling pressured or speedy, just notice what typically characterizes the tone of your day. And are you letting your rhythms, you know, each each thing that you're engaged in whether it's cooking food, preparing your food, or whether it's uh, doing a task at work, or picking someone up, or in the grocery store. Are you fully engaged? Are you letting the rhythm of um, what you're doing fully play out? And are you breathing while you're doing these tasks throughout your day? Whatever comprises your day, are you breathing? Are you fully engaged? Are you completing everything to a point where it feels complete, where it feels ripe? And so you have a natural transition to the next thing. Or again, are you rushing? Just notice there's no judgment, nothing to do. Just notice. And now take a few moments to notice if there's a particular area in your life where you may want to bring in a new choice of how to move through that rhythm. It may be that you noticed a particular um, uh, time of day where you're focused on something and, and you feel particular stress. See if you can focus on that time for a moment and see, is there another way I can approach this? Uh, is there another rhythm that I can bring into this so I can be breathing 
I can be engaged in another way, I can be t tapping my deep creativity. And so I can move freshly to the next thing without, um, you know, feeling that I'm uh, pressured or cutting off or cutting off from my own experience. And it may be just one little segment of your day where you notice, oh, I could do that differently. I definitely could do that differently. That's, I'm creating that, that claustrophobia. I'm creating that busyness. I'm creating that push. I can do just that one thing a little differently and fully breathe in that place and bring that breath and that time to its own completion. And then, in a very present way, begin the next moment. So let yourself just feel good about that uh, realization, whatever you may have explored, whatever you may have noticed. Sometimes the small things make a huge difference in our lives. There are a lot of uh, plants and nature beings in our book that really show us that, that it's the small things that do matter. Mm -hmm. Small differences matter. They make a difference. Mm -hmm. So feel really good about that. and Feel that goodness in your body. Just let it radiate. Feel it in your heart. Breathe it in and breathe it out. And again, tune in to the feeling of breath in your body, moving through your body. And the more you do this, the more you take time simply to breathe, the more connected you will feel to it. Sometimes when we haven't been done this for a while, it's hard to even, even breathe and be in a simple, relaxed way. But just give yourself time. Don't beat yourself up about that. Let your belly muscles soften and expand with that breath in. And remember that the breath has no judgment about uh, anything, and uh, everything is accepted. Uh, there's no good or bar bad parts of us. The breath wants to fully touch every aspect of who we are. And we can have that same unconditional regard for ourselves in these moments as we're breathing. No matter what I'm feeling, if I'm still feeling a little tense, or I have concern about this, or I, you know, I don't like this part of myself, it doesn't matter. Just allow it to be there. All of us is welcomed, the breath, loves to breathe into every part of us. And let's now bring this to a close and we'll take three nice deep breaths again together. One refreshing breath. Another deep relaxing breath. And one more nice refreshing and rejuvenating breath. <sighs> That was very nice. That was very, very nice. What came up for me is um, I almost put pedal in the metal throughout the whole day, and I like it. I like having lots of variety, and I do. I, and I, I work out, so I'm in and out of my body throughout the whole day, and I love it. It just feels like this great adventure. But there's not a little period of rest aside from when I sleep. So for me, that little gap, that little small change that you mentioned was just taking you know, 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the day to just relax. There are so many beautiful exercises here where you just sit and and just be, which I don't have at any moments of just sitting and being, even for like five minutes, even sitting and being. And then even concluding that with just being grateful and honoring what I did do and appreciating all the wonderful things that happened at kind of a gratitude practice. I don't have that, but I think that would be just, just a small thing. It doesn't have to be a long thing or an elaborate thing. Just, you know, three things that I'm really grateful for at the end of the day. It would just be kind of that nice little bow that ties up the end of the day, the transition from, you know, from activity to like rest and appreciation and gratitude and then sleep, you know. No, that was mine. Did did you have one when you, that came up for you? Yeah. Well, you know, and it's there's nothing wrong with being active and moving through yeah. life. You know, sometimes we like great speed, but are we breathing too? Yes. Yeah. There's there's a difference between being stressed 
and moving fast and, and being fully embodied as we're doing that, you know. Yeah. I guess what came up for me also was um, remembering that, uh, and I know I did a lot of it, maybe you did too, and I sh certainly, uh, my children did. It's so natural for children to daydream. Mm. So, you know, sometimes that little bit of rest, too, even if you're at your office cubicle and you just kind of look out the window or, you know, it, it's good for your eyes, too, just to kind of get a break off the screen mm -hmm. you know, and just take those little gaps and allow that space of daydream and that uh, really opens up our imagination. Mm. That's a beautiful so, one. You know, just to bring it in little by little. Yeah, I love it. So we've been talking to um, Lynn Roberts, and we're talking about a book that she co-authored with Sandra Ingerman, Speaking with Nature, Awaiting the Deep Wisdom of the Earth. Thank you so much. Tell us a bit, little bit about your website and how we can get a little bit more about your workshops. I know you're going to be in um, uh, Omega Institute. Is that right? Yeah, I'll be at the Omega Institute in August, and I'll be teaching uh, based on the book Shifting into a Higher Consciousness, a weekend program, and then followed by an intensive five-day program with mm -hmm. Shifting, bringing in ancient and modern integration of practices. It's 90% experiential, oh, and it really is a life-changing experience for people. Mm -hmm. and that's eomega.org, and my website is llynroberts.com. And uh, you'll see all my books there. And also, I'm doing a webcast with uh, Whidbey Island's uh, Vision Quest guide, uh, Sheila Belanger, uh, this Sunday. And we're going deeply into uh, very simple practices that mm -hmm. we can do to open to nature's deep mystery. Yeah, lovely. That's followed by webcasts uh, through April, every Sunday. Uh, wow, that's a wonderful way to celebrate Earth Day. Thank you so much for being here. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.